basically shaped our society for a period of time. And because of several people who were academics called philosophers, formed a laboratory school at the University of Chicago, where he was a, an associate professor of, of um, pedagogy, I think, or maybe it was a philosophy, hired by William Rainey Harper, uh, the original president of the university. The um, University of Chicago was found with Rockefeller money in order to assuage his terrible guilt about what he had done. I understand, but I don't know. Um, that, that founding of that school, because it was, University of Chicago was such a hot place in the headlines, caused the creation of laboratory, so-called laboratory schools all over the country. Every state college and many universities had these so-called lab schools. Some of them still existed. At, you, you had a lab school at, right, Dave, at, uh, at Indiana. Uh, still have a school, but, but they're it's now, so different than they used to be. Uh, a lot of the lab schools have turned into child development, child care centers. Mm -hmm. That's what happened at my, my school, at oh. our, our university. Our children, though, attended the, my children attended the lab school. A lot of these schools were <coughs> babysitting educational, in, very good educational institutions for the faculty. Um, I happened to teach at one of these places at UCLA, and it was exactly not that because the it was truly a research and, and development and laboratory school because the intent was to create a student body there that was representative of all kids so that the research would be, uh, would be valid and uh, when it got translated into other schools. We're sincerely activist in, in the social sense of the word and the one that almost everyone knows about is John Dewey but there were, that there were dozens of others at colleges and universities all over the country who were influencing prospective teachers, pe people who were in, in training to become teachers, but also people who were required, in some cases, to take philosophy classes as a part of their liberal education. So it's, it's historically a subject that frankly is not talked about a lot in, in the history books, but is really, it, is more important than that. And so that's like just a very few minutes about that. And the second thing we're going to talk about for a longer period of time is how that movement, and it was a movement, how that movement affected schools a little bit, but the Chautauqua Children's School in particular. Because, as a matter of fact, John Dewey founded the Chautauqua Children's School. And so it's a piece of our history here that is incredibly important in the sense of that. Or the principal had enormous power in terms of what happened to young people. And to the extent that that teacher was well-trained, um, was empathetic, was socially responsible, then, then it was a fabulous system. To the extent that the teacher had prejudice, uh, was not well-trained, uh, was less than um, empathetic, whatever the word is, then it was not a good system. And the fact that we had universal public education 
and that you had to have enormous numbers of people working with in, in classrooms. It was not possible to ensure uh, uniformity of high standards. So in the American tradition, then what you do in a situation like that, whether it's automobiles or children, is you standardize and you credential and you certify and you test and you make certain that everyone is at a certain level so that that it is not possible to be, you know, I mean, that's supposedly not possible to be prejudiced against a racial minority or, or if affect them. That probably is underlying the major problem with what happened with progressive education. The more public problem had to do with what I said at the very beginning is that we were, we had to beat the Russians and we had to do it through science and math and because of Sputnik and therefore we had to va radically change our, uh, we thought we had to radically change our system in order to make that happen. Now, you may have other <coughs> Well, it's in making a case for, uh, I, I think you're absolutely right, Bob, but in making a case for uh, developmentally appropriate education, uh, part of our failing, I think, in what we're talking about in school reform is that we don't follow developmentally appropriate principles very often. And uh, I, I, the example I would use that I would want you all to take away from my being here, at least, is play. We, we, you know, we talked about play earlier, but play has stages. Uh, so if you think of the stages of the developing child, the, the solitary play, moving to parallel play about age two, at age three really moving into cooperative play, uh, and, and then the highest level of play for a preschooler is dramatic play, which, where the children are really interacting in, in, uh, in a housekeeping setting or, you know, playing doctor or, you know, a whole variety of of play themes. Uh, what's so interesting about play is that uh, based on the study, and I mentioned to Paul earlier because he was friends with Sarah Smolansky. Sarah Smolansky, uh, 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 educational psychologist, and, uh, did a lot of research at Tel Aviv uh, University and uh, a lot of replicated research. And many people don't understand that you can predict almost with 100% certainty uh, by looking at a five-year-old that is a good player and that is can use all the elements of play moving in and out of roles uh, taking the environment creating props doing all the things that are involved which is a lot of problem solving and a lot of social interaction to get a team going uh, and uh, you can predict the, that child that is a good player at age five without using any kinds of standardized tests. Mm -hmm. You can predict that child that's going to be the academically successful child. And probably and, and, a and you can look at that child. You can, if Sarah Smolansky, what she did was follow these children up at age 10, 15, and 25. And it followed right through. Uh, and I think so few people understand that. Uh, and, and, we, and then we subsequently get this inappropriate curriculums thrown on children, and we get inappropriate things. And if you take that, if you extrapolate that to every aspect of development, uh, and you, what developmentally appropriate says to us is that you make the most of having the children, the child, develop the skills that are appropriate at that particular given time. Uh, and you don't push them ahead, you don't push them behind, you let them grow, grow and you let them grow to the fullest extent, of time, uh, extent possible, and uh, you're, going to, you're going to find a successful Child. And they're also going to you're also going to build their self-esteem because they have genuine they have genuine uh, skill. Uh, you know, you can't, you know, those of us in preschool in, in the child development program, we just cringe at star charts and all this competition 
where you have children competing with each other, and, and a, a big part of the progressive movement was try to, trying to eliminate that competition, and, and yet we are so insistent on pushing that down on kids it, throughout our school system, and and even into the even into the preschool years. Do children get to play anymore growing up, or is it all so organized? Well, I think there's an awful lot of organization. Yeah, and there's an awful lot of really uh, there's an awful lot of misunderstanding about how critical play is in those preschool years. And, and when, you know, when I people that would know my wife and I come up, and the first thing they're going to tell us often is how wonderful their child is doing with ABCs, or they're reading, or they're doing something very academic at a very young age. And, and I'm just sort of lost and say that's very nice, but gosh, why would you ruin that child's life <laughs> by making them do that when they could be playing? You know, so. But don't you think, Alan, that that has a lot to do with Parental expectation. Oh, it does. Board. It does, and we have we have reinforced this through the entire country, uh, where we're not where we're not letting parents, young parents, know what how valuable this is, and we do we're doing a terrible disservice. Now I see uh, because I serve as an advisor to the Office of Child Development, and Early Learning in the state of Pennsylvania where there are millions of dollars going out to preschool programs, uh, I sometimes sit there and think, this doesn't sound like much fun, folks. <laughs> you know, I don't know. You know, we're extinguishing, we're extinguishing some pretty critical aspect. With the schools that preceded them, which are called usually traditional schools, and the schools that followed them, because progressive schools did not last beyond Sputnik, for the most part. And the reason that didn't last beyond Sputnik was, um, well, it's, it's sort of an old joke. Lab or, or progressive schools had carpet on the floors, and traditional schools had hardwood floors. <laughs> And it was said in the Eisenhower administration that you could not beat the Russians on the rugs. So we had to go to another kind of school because of Sputnik. All right, what you have in front of you is kind of uh, not the children's school song, which is on the other side. Will, we'll, that'll be the very end, right? Uh, what you have on the front of this is a kind of different aspects of schools. And sometimes these are called commonplaces. The commonplaces are these deliberate choices that schools make about thousands of different... You didn't know, right, that, that, that a higher being didn't hand down that schools had to be graded like first, second, eighth, ninth grade, or that you had to have textbooks, or that you have to have teachers that were certified. I mean, that was, these are all choices that people make, and sometimes these are called commonplaces. So I just chose three of these so-called choices or commonplaces. One of them has to do with the kind of materials that kids and teachers have, and you see three different choices across that uh, continuum. Well, it's not really a continuum or the way school classrooms look, or the way in which testing or evaluation and assessment occur. Um, I'm so glad that Steve Tigner is not here tonight because he would kill me over, over this, because the subtitle of this thing is it's really truly an oversimplification. But, you know, some of the obvious things, like in a traditional school, you would not have this board because you could only have blackboards. Not you couldn't have whiteboards. That was really too progressive for a lot of traditional schools. Do they have them then? Um, whiteboards? No. 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 What? Did they have them then? No. Blackboards? Whiteboards. No, 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 no. So what? It wasn't even possible to have them. Plus, we didn't have the erasable uh, markers. Never. Um, and then a progressive school would be more likely to have something called an opaque projector, which meant that you could, in my case, for example, you could put a, um, 
a map of the world, you could project it and then you could outline it and then you could use it for the rest of the year to do things with kids that interrelated um, economies and history and ecology and all that kind of stuff which is, is the integration of subject matter is truly uh, an important part of aggressive schools. Or in today's school you might not have either a whiteboard or a blackboard but you would have this whole wall would be a gigantic screen and there would be live transmissions and, and the like. Or in a traditional school you would have like more like straight rows. In the first classroom I taught in, um, not you Sally, right, but in my classroom there were the the desks were nailed to the floors, mm -hmm. and they were the desk in which there was a desk and then the seat that came down, and actually an inkwell, although I am not really that old that they used the inkwells, but that was at Santa Barbara Avenue Elementary School in Los Angeles, that's what we, that's what we had. In a progressive school, it would be more likely to have open space so that kids, teachers, and parents, and others who are in the school are moving around more friend, freely, and in a more, ma in a more traditional school today, you would have more individual workspaces. Uh, in, in regard to testing, uh, it's a huge, this may be the most important difference between the three kinds of schools. In traditional schools in the old days, when teachers and others had time, there would be a lot more essays and a lot more written work. In progressive schools, it's possible that, that teachers would pay a lot more attention to performance, like speaking and writing and the ability to listen and make sense out of what was heard. And in today's schools, um, you're going to find much more likely to have machine tests that are scored by machines in which there are right, definitely right and wrong answers. Now, that's just so quick, but I, the only reason I did this was to just try to give you an idea that there are certain choices that societies make and that these choices reflect the orientation of that society to what they want, it wants people to be. So in the, more, the schools of today, what we're tremendously interested in is people's ability to hold a job, to get a job, and to do that job well. In a traditional school, we were much more interested in youngsters understanding the rich history and literature and science that informed the way in which a good life could be led. And in a progressive school, we were much more interested in people being able to fulfill themselves in ways that somehow they were meant to be. So that the school focused, that school focused more on the individual and that person's relationship with one's fellows and others in the group. So with that as kind of like a little uh, platform, what our two friends are going to talk about here is how that our school, our Chautauqua Children's School, somehow related to that larger movement. And in some ways, I, I'll start probably with this, exceeded it. I mean, it was a, a different orientation and then came back to the more progressive movement. So the way this is going to work is that I'm going to ask a few questions as we uh, move along, uh, they'll answer them. You chip in whenever you want and, and supplement or ask other questions. And then at the end, a, a little bit will re be reserved for a larger conversation among the whole group. Bob, would you call this technique that you just outlined uh, a traditional or progressive? I would call it incredibly traditional, what I just okay. did, because I didn't, well, I, no, let me back up just a little, because I did ask you to contribute, but quietly, right? <laughs> but I'll get more progressive, because at the end I'll ask you to share, but I'm not letting you share yet, so it's much more traditional. Are you thinking of that thing up there? The video? Did you forget? Oh, I did forget. Oh, thank you. Well, 
I thought, yeah, after our, all this work. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. I thought you might like to see a traditional look at progressive education. No, that's not the word. I thought you might like to see the way progressive education is often seen in our society, particularly in the 50, 40s and 50s, when this film was made. Now, what am I doing? Press, no, this is just, here, here, I'll help you. I, I need, oh, no, 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 no. okay. Thank you, Sal. <laughs> What you have just seen is the um, is the executor of the estate of Patrick Dennis in in the movie Anti Man, and he has just gone to see the school where young Patrick has been taken by Anti Man, and he thinks it is a traditional school, a boarding school, but. Knowing Maine, it is not a traditional school. It is, um, it is one in which progressive education occurs. And so what you'll see now in a moment is how it all plays out. I don't like this latest fan of yours. Fad? Patrick? Yes, I've seen you through yogi, soap sculpture, modern dance, and nature foods. And I've seen you take each one up as if nothing else existed. And then I've seen you drop them all. You mean you play as if Patrick is just a temporary enthusiasm? It's called molding a new little life. Don't be ridiculous. Somebody were to have come to Chautauqua, let's say, in 1875, and looked at the education of young children here, what is it likely that they would have seen? <clears throat> well, <clears throat> first of all, I must tell you that I, with this assignment, I went to the archives and uh, talked to John Schmidt. I should have talked to Joan. For, well, I think I talked to Joan at the same time. But actually, in reality, there's very little in the archives about those very early days. Uh, clearly, Chautauqua was started as a Sunday school training facility. Uh, <clears throat> Joan has, has documentation that in 1875 there were 300 children a day in Tenth C. Now, your imagination with Tenth C and mine are probably identical. I think it was pretty chaotic. They wouldn't have had any equipment. They'd have been on the ground. They'd have been playing. And there would have been adults there that would have been trying to focus the children. I, I, there's no documentation that says that these were young children. This was children. So I would sort of guess that that was pretty much all the children in Chautauqua were forced into Tennessee. And, uh, and they <laughs> while were, their parents were out while their parents doing, were doing other things. Children, right. teachers, yeah. And so, uh, you know, if you think of, the, of that time, uh, it probably would have, the, the activities would have related a little bit like what probably some of us experienced as Vacation Bible School. So there would have been some games, there would have been, you know, Chautauqua was this wonderful place in the woods, so they couldn't have corralled them all in there for the length of time that they were there. So uh, I, it is very interesting, and I put in the little timeline, which basically is thanks to Joan, by 1878, Lewis Miller had donated the Children's Temple. The Children's Temple was on the uh, across from the library on the on Bester Plaza. Uh, <clears throat> now, there's no real indication. I don't think you have photographs of you know whether there were benches and chairs or or what that facility looked like. Uh, it's very interesting, though, in the research that I did, I came across a, a dissertation done by John Malcolm in 1972. And in that was a quote, and I'm just going to sort of paraphrase. It was a quote from Lewis Miller 
to a, a good friend uh, in 1872 at a, camp, at a Canton, Ohio Sunday school camp meeting. And basically, Lewis Miller said, <clears throat> most Sunday school teachers were also teachers in secular schools. And what a great idea to get these teachers together, uh, have a uh, three week, two or three week camp meeting, uh, give them some inspiration for teaching, get them rested and relaxed, and be ready for Sunday school and for regular school in the, uh, in the fall. Uh, <clears throat> I thought that was, was just an amazing quote. Uh, it was by, quote, uh, Jane Bush, Bush? Book. Book. Jane, Jane Book. Jane. Uh, Kate. 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 Kate Book. Kate Brook. Brooke. Brooke. We we'll get it. Kate Brook. Whose sister, whose sister <laughs> was married to Lewis Miller's brother. So uh, his, this sister, the two of these women, uh, uh, Joan knows, came to Chautauqua in 1872. They were so enthralled with this Fairpoint that in that year they bought lot number 16, which is the Lewis Miller Cottage. Mm -hmm. So, uh, <clears throat> but it, to me, it demonstrated that from the get-go, adult education and uh, <coughs> the children's program were all together. There was no real separation. They were looking at a model of teacher training, they were looking at, at establishing a curriculum and ideas for, for Sunday school. Now and those now, those same teachers who were going back in the fall, what at, what did their schools look like? From, well, from the uh, next... they would have looked like, when you asked the question about memory from school, they would have looked just like the school I attended, uh, which was after the war. It was a reopened one-room schoolhouse. All the desks were screwed down, and there was a big furnace in the middle where the teacher had to fire the furnace. I mean, that's what they would have looked like in the 1870s. Uh, and, and the methodology would have been recitation and memorization and probably not adequate books. Uh, probably uh, it would have been pretty rigid. Uh, the, the exact thing that Dewey was reacting to, uh, the, the, the extreme rigidity. Uh, it's also interesting to note that uh, uh, I think what, what somewhat influenced the school movement and the Sunday school and the, and the adult ed was really uh, the Methodist. Method, Methodists Methodist, uh, <clears throat> really didn't particularly separate secular from religious. And because of that, it's, my first question was, how, in, in thinking about this assignment, was how do you separate uh, religious Sunday school? When did it, when did it switch from being uh, a Sunday school training or a Sunday school type atmosphere to uh, the 1921 sort of model nursery school? Mm -hmm. uh, there's really no documentation of how that happened. <clears throat> but I think when you think about the Methodist roots of this institution, uh, you think of uh, people who did not separate the secular from the religious. They felt uh, education was critical, uh, and, uh, and they wanted to see people go back and create a better community. Uh, and, uh, and I think that was, just, that was just real basic. Also, another, uh, just from reviewing Jeff Simpson's uh, Chautauqua book, if you've read his uh, history, uh, Jeff happens to be a friend of ours, and uh, <clears throat> he, I, I was struck by the, the notation that he makes early in that book that Chautauqua was really the national podium from 1875, 1874 to 1925, where ideas were really discussed. Chautauqua was uh, well known, uh, uh, and, uh, and it was really sort of in the forefront of progressive movements and, and the whole... Not just education. Not just but education, but all, <coughs> women's of, education. all of that. And, and so when you look at the history of the, of the nursery school, and, and if you look at the, at the timeline, and you, <coughs> you think of the other things that were happening at the same time, uh, Froebel and the kindergarten movement, 
which was primarily a Midwestern movement. Uh, you look at the theorists and the people that were working out of Chicago, uh, the whole nursery school movement uh, was very closely tied to home economics. Mm -hmm. And if you know anything about the history of Chautauqua, domestic science and home economics was critical here. Uh, Cornell had an early presence here with extension services, uh, and it was all really, really very tied, uh, very tied together. Um, Joan, you were so close to the beginnings of the school. I mean, not the real beginnings. I'll edit that. That's okay. <laughs> Joan, you were <laughs> instrumental in the continuation of the children's school. Uh, talk a bit about about where it started and where you came into it. Well, Alan just spoke about the Children's Temple. And the Children's Temple was uh, given by Lewis Miller. It was his gift, that building. Uh, and then we had, you know, we had all of these locations for education. It was just overwhelming. They were all over the ground. But before I go into those, I want to speak about Frank Beard. Um, this is Frank Beard over here. And he was critical to the Children's Temple. He really was the program. He's the chalk talker. And he was the first chalk talker. He was on the Lyceum circuit for 25 years. And we were lucky enough to get him at Chautauqua the very first year. And he and Vincent were like this. They were very good buddies. Uh, he passed away in 1905. Or, yeah, 1905. He came from this huge, talented family of artists. Everybody in the family seemed to be an artist. And he also, his sisters and his brothers, were the founders of the Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts. So they had lots of skills going for them. Beard was a cartoonist as well as a chalk talker and an illustrator. He was an inventive leader. He was fearless defender of justice. And in his cartoons, which I have over there, you'll see that, uh, that he, he cartooned every sort of uh, political event that was around. Uh, he, it's quoted when he spoke. He presents the fundamental truth appertaining to human well-being in the simplest form and yet so vividly that deep impressions are made on all hearts through his chalk and his humor. He had lots of humor. And Beard felt that every student must participate in their own learning. So he was the inspiration and the designer for the Chautauqua desk. And I have a, a salesman's model over there. It's a smaller model. But the Chautauqua desk is the original laptop. <laughs> <laughs> An acoustic laptop. Yes. It, only it's manual. You, you turn the scroll, right? Were they uh, uh, marketed around the, the country? or You they, say it's a salesman's model. That's a salesman's model. They were never sold to schools. It was a parent, it was a parent child. Thing. They sold two million before they went belly up in, in the depression. Mm -hmm. And they made many, many improvements. But I have this huge connection to this wonderful Frank Beard because uh, he is the inspiration for the desk. And my family, it was manufactured, it was inspired here, but manufactured in Valparaiso, Indiana, outside of Chicago. My whole mother's family was involved in the desk, and I was inspired to write a book about it, which is over there, a booklet, let's put it that way. Uh, and, and it's been said that Frank Beard's legacy to, to the American life is the Chautauqua desk. Now, back to... I'd like to add that in my research, Vincent was so excited yeah. those first years about Frank Beard that he decided every Sunday school that he had any contact 
had to have a chalkboard. So, so before this desk came out, they were trying to get chalkboards in church Sunday schools uh, all over the country. One of, one of Frank Beard's talents, he figured out you didn't have to have a slate. You could take a board and paint it, so you didn't have to carry around this heavy slate. That was one of the things he figured out. But he also did the minutes for the uh, children's temple, and they were they were really amazing. He did all the illustrations on them. But now back to where where everything was on the grounds. The breadth was everywhere. The Froebel people were here. It was a Krauss couple, and they had teacher instruction. But that don't, I'm sorry. You, you've used two words, and I don't know what they mean. The breast and the foible. The 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 breadth, the breadth on the grounds. There was there was spread, 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 <laughs> spread. Okay. And foible was kinder. Foible is the kindergarten people, okay. and they used his policies and his teaching style. The Kraus people. Did Froebel, was he German and then moved to the Middle West? Uh, he, he was German. Whether he ever lived in the Middle West or not, oh. I don't know. But in the German communities, in the Plains and in the Midwest, is where there was this real emphasis on a kindergarten movement. Was it? Uh, uh, and, it, it was, and it was really playing in the garden. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not, you know, the kindergarten of of today where you have to read and keep a journal and <laughs> <laughs> so it's a very different kindergarten. It was I more did. of a doing kindergarten. Yes. But it was a training for it was a tra training for like well, something like Montessori. I mean right. it was different. It was a training, but I mean, right. yeah. it was a training for kindergarten. But I, I don't it's different than Montessori. Yeah, it's yeah, sure. not it's not that specific. No, I just believe but there was a structured training right. program for kindergarten teachers. And it was here at Chautauqua. Right. And one of the things that came out of some of this was the Chautauqua architectural blocks. And they're over there on the table. And these were given to Frank Lloyd Wright by his mother when he was two or three years old. <laughs> so there you go. Success was his. So those are the architectural blocks. Very developmentally appropriate. <laughs> Um, they had teachers' classes in the museum, which is now gone, by 1886, and Mrs. Jewett gave her house for their residence. So that 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 still is used for a staff residence, but at that time it was for teachers only. Uh, Mrs. B. T. Vinson, who was the bishop's sister-in-law, she conducted the little people's class in 1896 in Kellogg Hall. And that's also where the Chicago Institute people were. And that was a very, very big program. Then we had John Dewey coming along about that time. But then on, over on the Overlook, we had some action. Uh, Henrietta Orb Jones, who's the founder of the Burden Tree Club, uh, she had a Montessori kindergarten all of you know she has that Italian loggia house and on the side is where she had the kindergarten. She had that maybe six or seven years. Uh, now all this took place before private nursery schools were even around. They didn't come around until 1918 and of course it was much earlier than early push for a head start. Now one of the most interesting things was that I found there was a <coughs> school of mother craft in 1914, it was at Four Heading. Now, Heading isn't where it is today. Heading is Vincent, up the hill. So that house that's on the corner of Vincent and Terrace was the Mothercraft house. And she not only had babysitting there and table boarders, but she did college studies as well. Then in the 1950s, the New York University people came and they offered accredited programs in practice teaching and courses. It was very extensive and a big connection to Chicago. They formed one of the first parent institutes. 
Now, I bet you didn't know that the very first PTA was founded here by our mothers in all these little programs. And that was founded in 1895. And the National Teachers Association, which is now NEA, had a major big conference here in 1880. So that is really, really early. I have just one question. You said in 1914 when Henrietta Ward Jones had the kindergarten, it was a Montessori kindergarten? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's mm -hmm. great. Yeah. Okay. Now, I, I just want to read you a little excerpt. Um, I don't know if it was the Chautauqua Assembly Herald or the Daily, but a reporter went over to the kindergarten to, to see, what, see what they were doing. So the reporter called at Kellogg Hall yesterday morning just as the wee kindergartners were taking to their recreation. Such a jolly time as they have, especially during the wet weather. The course this season is interdependence, and the instruction is given from the point of view of home and nature. And then he describes their marching around and singing and having, you know, this good time. But he notices this one little girl who in my estimation was way ahead of her time. One tiny tot, who I supposed to be a boy because of her boy clothes and her short hair, was inexpressibly cute. She was always dressed as a boy so that she may have greater free freedom of movement and enjoy her play to the utmost. <laughs> now, they later in the article he talks about their field trip from Kellogg over to Terrace to see the shoemaker. Now the shoemaker was the Bojin family, and that was the building right next to the Chautauqua Inn, which they own. So that's where they went for the um, for their field trip. So now we're up to where the children's uh, school started. What you just described? 1896. Pretty early. So we'll stop there because the children's school is the was built in 1821. Oh, 1921. 1921. 1921. And neither Joan or I worked there then. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, the, the new, the, the, today's 90s is the new 30s. So, <laughs> um, so describe, Joan, describe the children's school that you knew. How did, what oh, went on in the place? I know that. What's your years? What years? I was there in the 60s and 70s, uh, which is seems like yesterday, though. It was a long time ago. So it was built in 1921, and the, and the purpose of the school had three purposes, work, play, and study. <coughs> now, the Percy Gerwig pergola that you see up there, that originally was down where Holbrook Church is. And that was a huge sandbox. And you brought your, your child over there, pinned a note on their back, and left them in the sandbox for the day. <laughs> so, and just dropped them off. Uh, originally, the building had just two sections and was open in the middle. And later they enclosed that because they needed more space, of course. In 46, they added the smaller porch. They added a back room in 1969. I got a large porch added during the very rainy season in 1974. And then all of you know about the recent uh, renovations. Nancy Miller Arn was my assistant for many, many years. And Nancy and I added pre-club. And the, and the parents were extremely uh, delighted because we didn't have the break. Like We felt that the children were too tired to have that lunch break and then come back. So they brought their lunch and they stayed till 2 o'clock. And it was a great thing for everybody. Um, we also added a babysitting chorus where we had the sheriff come. We added uh, first aid courses for teachers. And then when I realized that New York University had been here as an accredited institution, 
I said, well, we should do that too. So we added a practicum and an independent study with the University of Pittsburgh. And then the next step was for that to add a parent council. And we had a really strong parent council going. It was really a wonderful thing. Then, then when I saw that Boys and Girls Club had a song and had colors, I said, well, why don't we have those? So our colors were black and blue. <laughs> <laughs> and our song is my only composition. Uh, we will be singing it later. It's my only musical composition. Then, to satisfy the safety for the children and the parents' uh, needs for that safety, uh, we color coded the rooms. We had everybody come early and paint. So we had the red room, the blue room, and all of those rooms. Then we created the badge, which of course was black and blue, and the color of the child was in there, so you knew if they got in the wrong room. <clears throat> then I was appalled to see that nobody was on the bus with them beside the bus driver. So I invented the luggage tags on the back, because if you put them on the front, the kid takes more. So we had the luggage tags on the back, which are still being used today. The bus went from where to where? Everybody's house to Grandma's house. Pick, pick them up at each house. Yeah, and takes them home. Right. To everybody's house, which is different than today. Right. We dropped them off at the houses. They'd say, Grandma lives in the blue house. Did you use the spirit? Was that the spirit? The spirit, yes. The, the spirit, spirit of the chocolate bus, if some of you remember right. the spirit. What happened to the sandbox? Oh, the sandbox moved up the hill and, and got bricked in. But I mean the concept. Oh, we had sandbox. Of, no, 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 no. Of dropping the kids off at the sandbox, <laughs> and then that would be, wasn't that what they did? They started off in the sandbox, and then the school day began, and they left from the sandbox later? Is that I don't know. Was? I wasn't there. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, Joan. <laughs> How long was the season at that time for these kids, and were they all there for the whole season at that they time? Were, they could come for a week. Some of the courses were three and four weeks, some were the whole summer. It but it was nine weeks then. Was it in nine weeks? Oh, no. no. It wasn't eight. nine weeks. It was in the early time. No. Well, yeah. in the very early days, it was only three weeks, right? Or two weeks even. The first season was two weeks. Two weeks. In August. Yeah. Mm. Joan, you said the three purposes were work, uh, play, and learning. And study. Oh, study. Uh, study. Yeah. Uh, what play? was the work? Yeah, that was one Children's work is play. <laughs> Children's work is play. Oh, well, that's a little different. Putting <laughs> <laughs> their things in their cubbies probably would be sort of... Well, if children's it's work is children. play, what is play? <laughs> play is life. I mean, it, you said there are three purposes. Work, play, <laughs> and study. And study. That's what... That's what but I'm how do you differentiate then between work and play if you don't work is play <laughs> well i thought there were maybe there were there were in a typical and i because i worked at the children's school yes i was hired by joan i worked there in 69 he was a doctoral <laughs> student i worked there in 69 and in 70 uh, 40 years ago what yes, color was, room were you in i was purple, purple. <laughs> <laughs> i was uh, i was assistant teacher to florence gardner so many of you know Florence in the, in the, in the last few years, she uh, was a uh, uh, reading, reading teacher, specialist. reading specialist, and she worked, you could, you could sign up for Florence's reading courses. Uh, I, I got hired, thankfully, I was a doctoral student in early childhood and I had never worked in any group setting with young children. And uh, in western Pennsylvania where I grew up and was studying, uh, they wouldn't hire you in the public schools to work below th third grade or below. Men couldn't be hired. Uh, so there really wasn't an opportunity to professionally work with children. Uh, when I, I would distinguish between play, which we might call free play, mm -hmm. and play, which are the choices within the classroom, and in a, in a high quality child care program or, or uh, nursery school, you uh, should have five different choices. So that's the, the environment in which is set up by the teachers that you move to. 
yeah. housekeeping to block play to you have different centers and the different centers so the children choose those centers uh, and uh, and operate from there then you have what's what's called uh, either outdoor or indoor uh, total free play uh, which would be slightly different but it's also a critical part of the day uh, so uh, and the children's school was really set up that way I mean it was very University of Pittsburgh has a very, very strong uh, play commitment. Uh, we're talking about the, the uh, based on the work of Anna Freud, Eric Erickson, uh, these theorists that really followed Dewey, uh, but have a very strong connection with that, uh, with that movement. Uh, <clears throat> I, I think uh, the, the, the typical nursery school is so and continues to be so committed to that because it's developmentally appropriate. You can't, you can't literally force large groups of children to do some of the things that we can make them do in first grade, second grade, whether they should be doing it or not. You really can't do that with groups of young. Well, so compare your experiences with the Chautauqua Children's School and what you see in nursery school, so-called nursery schools today. How, how is that different? Well, the, the big problem today, the universal problem, is the push-down curriculum, which I refer to as more the merrier, sooner the better, that syndrome. Uh, now, certainly you have precocious children. You, you know, one in 400 or something is reading at age four. You know, but, but with, a, with, a, uh, with a good child development approach, you can accommodate those children very easily in this more open classroom, which is really what was the thesis of the progressive movement, an open classroom allowing children to make continuous progress, uh, not, you don't hold anyone back. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's really, that's really the core of a, of a good, of a good uh, preschool. Uh, the, the, the issues, uh, <clears throat> well, there are tons of issues in, in related to today in relation to uh, child development. The, the, since both my wife and I were professionally involved with child development and child studies all our lives, uh, we were very depressed. I mean, there's lots of money coming in, but there are really, we have a very inadequate supply of professionals in this field because the field has paid nothing for years. It's basically been private nursery schools, self-pay child care programs, uh, Head Start, which is government supported. Co-op schools. Uh, co schools. But you basically have a field which has not paid well. So from the academic standpoint, it's very hard to convince a dean of, uh, of a college to invest in a faculty to train people to work in a field that really is paying minimum wage. Uh, actually, part of the way as a professional, uh, when I was a full-time faculty member and had interns here at the uh, at the Chautauqua Children's School in the last few years that I worked, uh, the issue was uh, Kit, the director, was having difficulty maintaining a stable core of well-trained aides uh, because you couldn't live in Chautauqua with what they pay at the children's school. Uh, and, and nor could you anywhere in the, in the United States. So it's not, you know, it's not different anywhere else. Uh, so the interns were a viable option. Uh, and the only way that was made workable was that we provided housing for them. So uh, usually those, uh, those student interns were either housed at the girls' club or in alumni hall. Uh, and and that, was, that was one way of having some trained individuals, uh, undergraduates, who received college credit. It wasn't unlike the University of Pittsburgh uh, internship program that, that happened in, this, in the 60s and 70s. That was uh, one of the reasons I did the practicum, because they got no money. I mean, originally when I took over the school, they got a gate pass and no money at all. And I immediately said, we are not taking any high school students. They have to all be early childhood people.
people in college. And so that was, and I managed to get a small amount of money for them. But that wasn't enough so that even though they had to pay the tuition for the course, they at least got something out of it. But the advantage of the children's school, you not only have very bright children, you have summer, they can be outdoors, you have the symphony to come, and you have the play and the theater, you have all of those people to come visit the school. You can go to the parking lot and study the, the uh, license plates, the color, where is it from, what do those numbers say, you know, all of those things. We used to go to the practice shacks with our graham crackers and say, trick or treat, would you play your instrument for me? <laughs> the the, uh, the um, thing that was, I think, the most wonderful year was one of the first years when we created the oldest group. They went and visited every major building at Chautauqua, if it wasn't too far away, and, and came back and made the building out of cardboard and what have you. And the whole room was filled with Chautauqua buildings. It was, it was really terrific. So the opportunity project. here That's is... That's project approach. <laughs> That's the project the approach. And, and we don't care what the building looked like. It was the process, right? And, and the opportunity here is unmatched. You couldn't find it anywhere else. Majority of your students were there most of the summer, John? Yes, and that's the big change. And that's the big difference now, Lynn, right? I mean, well, they're, they're here for a week. Or, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, I think at the most, uh, 40, I'm trying to remember. We didn't have yes. everybody. No. Are there for the whole summer. Um, the largest is there, a number is there for one week of the yeah. summer. And it's interesting to have to have curriculum, you know, for nine different weeks. Right. That will also interest the child that's there for the whole summer. Mm -hmm. So we wow, really yeah. have to be clear. Mm -hmm. that, uh, we had about half the season. The, about half of us. But even the other half were here three weeks, two right. weeks, four weeks. Well, they were here. It's changed. Yeah. But it just really reflects the gauge. Yeah. The change in the last ten years. Is that right? Oh, very much so. When I started. There were a lot more seasoned, well, I'm sure you all realize sure. that we've been here, there were a lot more seasoned kids right. 10 years ago. I think Jeff Walker said there's 25 kids that are here for the full nine weeks. Did he say that? 25? Yeah, Jeff, Jeff told me he thinks approximately 25 I, I students think it was about 40 for the summer. Last year. I mean, because we keep track. We try to do some things with those kids, you know, a little different. Uh, yeah. All right, Alice, I do have a progressive mode about me, so let's just go around the table real quick and everybody pop out one thing that describes their elementary school. Come on, Nancy. What, what? Education. I can <laughs> give it to you if I could remember it. <laughs> <laughs> but what, but this, this was Catholic? Is that, do I remember that right? Uh, there was some of everything. Some of everything, all right. And some Canada, some United States. All right. What they do? Kick you out, Florence? Yeah, she couldn't. Yeah. No, I it, I wasn't really a discipline problem. <laughs> Her father was an engineer. That explains yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I went I was, to a two-room, eighth-grade school, so there was um, four grades to a room. Right. Yeah. yeah. You'll recognize the two. I think we ought to sing it twice. Yeah. Right? yeah that's a good idea. Yeah. So that those who are in the, what, the red group? Right. Yeah. <laughs> the red group. 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 The opportunity. Yeah. The opportunity. Uh, I've got the children's school enthusiasm down in my heart. Up in my head. Down in my toes, I've got the children's children's enthusiasm all 